the hosts can be pretty demanding too. Please watch. Go to EWTN.com forward slash on demand or download the free EWTN app and watch on Roku, Apple TV, Google TV, and Amazon Fire TV. We're on a mission to explore the greatest places of miracles in the entire Catholic world. We'll travel the globe to examine the top mysteries and marvels in history, from visions of the Virgin Mary and inexplicable medical healings, to the miracles of the Eucharist and those who bear the wounds of Christ. These are the wonders that have inspired the fascination and faith of believers for centuries. Welcome to EWTN News Presents the Synod on Synodality, where we are bringing you complete coverage of the final week of the Synod here in Rome. I'm Catherine Hadro, joined once again by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Matthew Bunsen is Vice President and Editorial Director of EWTN News, and Father Raymond D'Souza is a National Catholic Register contributor and priest in the Archdiocese of Kingston, Ontario. Great to be with you, gentlemen. Good again, to be back. As always, <laughs> as, always as yes. we continue our coverage. Well, today's Synod members continue to work on the summary report expected on Saturday. The Synod on Synodality has addressed the members of the Catholic Church in a letter published during the Synod's final days in what's called a letter to the people of God. The Synod invited the Catholic faithful to take an active role in the discernment and decision-making of the Church. And in an intervention, Pope Francis addressed the members of the Synod on Wednesday with sharp comments against clericalism, saying it is a whip, it is a scourge, and it is a form of worldliness. So quite a few headlines to delve into here at the top of the show. First off, this letter to the people of God. Uh, what should people know about this? Well, it's customary at the end of a synod that there's a kind of a message, uh, you know, because the documents come later. This is a little bit more lengthy, a little more formal than traditionally, mm -hmm. uh, but there's literally nothing in it. Uh, there's a few phrases here and there that might, if you're really <laughs> trying to uh, right. glean something, but it, that's indicative, I mean, it sounds like a criticism, but it's actually indicative of the way the Synod proceeds. It's not supposed to be making decisions, as we've been told over and over. So it's four pages or three or four pages, but it says what we did, it said we enjoyed doing it, we invite people to participate in this process, but it doesn't tell you decisions. So if you're looking at what did, this, what did the Synod decide about this, mm -hmm. this document actually is very responsible in that sense because it, it's not supposed to make decisions, so there are no decisions. So it's it's a it's a feel good letter, but there's no decisions there. Yeah. Well, in some ways too, it's almost a feel bad letter. A uh, feel bad letter. And <laughs> I, I say that <laughs> simply because uh, they note uh, the fact that there are the poor that need to be heard, mm -hmm. that want love. Mm -hmm. uh, so they acknowledge in this letter what has been discussed in the Synod Hall, and that is a lot of challenges that the, the church is facing, that the world is facing. They also acknowledge, because this is a letter that's going out from the Synod to the people of God, the crises in the world, and they talk about the fact that they are very much aware of the crises happening in the world. They're reflecting on it, and they're very much concerned about everything there mm -hmm. uh, that, that's going on. They also are very clear uh, in some of the aspirations uh, coming out of this. Now, 
no decisions are right. supposed to be made, although they do note, as you did, mm -hmm. uh, that there needs to be a greater decision making on the part of the laity. Right. But then we also get just a bit of a clue uh, as to what this final synthesis document is going to look like uh, in, in terms of its structure, where they look at the questions, the discussions, and then apparently proposals. So I in some ways it's a hat tip to what's coming this weekend. And just a, a quick refresher for our audience before we delve into the rest of the headlines. This synthesis document, how much weight does it carry and what's its purpose ahead of the second General Assembly next October? We don't know because it it seems to be, but we've been told by people who've seen it, that it's 40 pages long, single mm -hmm. space. It's a very long document, which sounds like it just it's going to record this is the kinds of things that were said. And we're going to discuss them further next year. Yes. So its importance will be what topics might be for further discussion. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to have the weight of any decisions because it's w for next year. Right. It might be declared, as the Holy Father did in 2014, he took the document from the first of the two family synods and said, this is the working document for next year. We don't have to redraft it. I don't know, but he might mm -hmm. do that, and that would simplify matters going forward. It would, yeah. It, it, if we talk about these final reports, the Holy Father receives it. He typically writes an apostolic exhortation based on it, his reflections, as he has done repeatedly with Amoris Laetitia, as we saw with Carita Amazonia coming out of the Amazonian Synod. Mm -hmm. This particular report, this mm -hmm. summary, is likely to have even less weight than they typically would, simply because this is a transitional document. Uh, similar to 2014, but even less so than that, because that was an extraordinary synod, right. I believe, leading into an ordinary one. This is the first phase of a two-part two. synod. So this is purely a document to help us down the road. Again, also yesterday, we, as we mentioned, Pope Francis addressed the synod. He had some sharp comments, strong words. What stood out to you both? Well, it was a bit of a... Uh, resume of some of his favorite themes I, it looked like i don't know for a fact but it looked like he was given off the cuff i don't think we were told in advance he was going to do it no. so he it was a spontaneous intervention mm -hmm. uh there was a few paragraphs where he spoke in an exceedingly harsh way about young priests of a more conservative bent uh that will hurt them but they're also well they're young so they might have got a, they may not have got accustomed to it because he's been doing it right from the beginning yeah. it's a little bit uh, hard to understand the um, the stridency of the remarks against clericalism because as we talked about throughout the week most of the energetic things going on in the church today are new movements and collaborations where lay people are taking the lead so it it's almost as if there was a constituency who was clamoring for a more tyrannical clerical authority if there if there it exists it's not here at the synod and it's almost nowhere else so that was part of it and then there was another section about how uh, the faith is handed on in families mm -hmm. uh, grandmothers and mothers in particular and i don't know if he was saying that to remind the synod because we don't know what was discussed there but at least in the public discussions the role of the family has actually not been very prominent here so maybe he was trying to bring that to the bring fore forward. yeah francis uh has made clericalism one of those return to topics. Uh, it's almost a bete noir for him mm. uh, in, in terms of concerns. We have seen that throughout this pontificate and at the very start of this synod, he gave a, a book that was a combination of some of his lectures and spiritual mm -hmm. advice and other things, but that also included a letter that he sent to the clergy of Rome that excoriated them uh, for the, the problems of clericalism and how they dress and other things. So this is returning to that same rhetorical device. So it's interesting that he opened the synod mm. by stressing clericalism. Now he's essentially almost closing the synod with the same theme. Yeah. It also says that uh, we can anticipate in the synthesis document, I think it's safe mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. uh, references uh, to clericalism and its impact, because I think that's something Francis really wants in there. Mm. With the time that we have left at the top of the show, I want to bring up this book that you picked up, Father Raymond yeah. D'Souza. So we mentioned yesterday a new interview book with Pope Francis that was released in Italy this week right. in which Pope Francis was very clear that holy orders is reserved for men. But this book was actually published in June in right. Spanish. So this is the Italian version uh, called Non Se Solo, You Are Not Alone, uh, Challenges, Answers, and Hopes. Uh, so it came out this week in Italian here. 
I was actually surprised because it made quite a bit of news. The answers were interesting, but the book was actually published in Spanish in uh, its original language in June. So I, it's one of those in interesting things that we don't always know what's going on, even though Spanish is the majority language in the church today. But the Pope Francis here answers a lot of questions, foreign policy, his own biography. But on the question of women deacons, mm. He says this is not going to happen because it's part of holy orders and holy orders are reserved to men. And he, he said, I've done two commissions on this issue. So, But it's very interesting. We'll probably pick it up at the end of the show, this approach about having discussions that are not decisions. But again, he was very clear yes. yet again on this issue. That's right, on, on the ordination of women. And uh, that's a topic that keeps coming back largely because of the press. Uh, but it's something that Francis continues to answer despite the press. Absolutely. And again, it, its title in Spanish is El Pastor Desafios, Razones y Reflexiones sobre su Pontificado. Hopefully that was my it attempt at <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> it has a different uh, in, title in, in Italian. Right. And then the English is The Shepherd Struggles, Reasons, and Thoughts on His Papacy. Right. Uh, right. So in, in the Italian, it's... You're Again, not you're not alone. And right. from that standpoint, that's a message, too, that Francis is sending. And I think also it's a message that in the Synodal Hall, he wants to impart as well, that we are all here together. You are not alone. Well, we'll pick we, up on... Which is interesting mm -hmm. because one of the criticisms when uh, he excoriates if his own clergy or clergy in general or certain factions in the world of politics or whatever is that it undermines that uh, totos, 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 tutti, 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 <laughs> everyone, everyone, everyone right. uh, message because it seems that everyone is welcome, but some may be less welcome than others. <laughs> so it's an interesting dynamic, but we'll pick this up at yep. the end of the show when it's uh, there's... It gives you a key to how what's going on here is uh, unfolding. Maybe some young priests who are out buying very lace-filled uh, cassocks <laughs> might perhaps uh, <laughs> want to read this book. So we'll continue that conversation in just a bit. But for now, synod bishops are addressing topics ranging from local synod participation to the ordination of women. Here's our latest report. Dal Vangelo secondo Marco. After a day off for the Synod participants, the next general congregation was held in the Synod Hall, during which the draft of the synthesis report was presented by the gathering's general relator, Cardinal Jean-Claude Haldrick. As usual, before the afternoon session, a briefing was held in the Holy See press office. Uh, certainly my own experience, first as a Vatican diplomat, Speaking about his experience of taking part at the Synod, Archbishop Timothy Brolio, the president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, underlined the need in the future to encourage greater participation by the faithful everywhere. Participation in the two years leading up to the Synod, less than 1% of the Catholics throughout the world participated. So I think one thing going forward that we have to do is to encourage greater part participation and invite people to uh, uh, to partake and 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 really engage in this process of speaking and listening and praying together. I think that would be a source of of really growth for the for the church. Among the other speakers at the briefing was newly appointed Cardinal Robert Francis Prevost, prefect of the dicastery for bishops. When asked about the role of women in the church and the controversial issue of women's ordination, the cardinal said... Ordaining women, and there's been some women that have said this, interestingly enough, um, clericalizing women doesn't necessarily solve a problem. It might make a new problem. And that uh, perhaps we need to look at a new understanding or different understanding of both leadership, power, authority, and service, above all service, in the church from the different perspectives that can be, um, if you will, uh, brought to the life of the church by women and men. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. In the evening after the release of the Synod's letter to the people of God, participants took part in a rosary in the Vatican. And joining us now is Jonathan Liedel, Senior Editor for the National Catholic Register. Jonathan, thanks for your reporting and thanks for being with us. Great to be with both of you. You've been covering the Synod in great detail, in great depth. What are you hearing from the delegates throughout your reporting? Are, what are their concerns? 
Yeah, Catherine, uh, there definitely have been some concerns raised by the delegates. I think one big question on people's mind is, is this a synod of bishops, right? It is, of course, mostly made up of bishops, but 27% of the voting members are non-bishops. Mm -hmm. So it raises questions about a possible confusion between the role of bishops and non-bishops in the life of the church and in the authority of the recommendations that are going to be made at the end uh, of this synodal process. Mm -hmm. I think another question people have is, how rooted uh, is the methodology in what the Holy Spirit has already to told us, right? So there's certainly this mm -hmm. emphasis on communal discernment and trying to hear what the Spirit might be saying us today. But as we know, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us for 2,000 years, mm -hmm. right? Through the mm -hmm. church's authoritative teaching. So definitely those are some concerns that have been raised to me. But mm -hmm. one thing I'd point out is the same people raising concerns to me also relay a, a kind of trust, right? That this could be something good in the life of the church and they have that trust because uh, they underscore that most of the people there are animated by goodwill, mm. a love of the church, and a love of Jesus. And ultimately, this is a consultative process. So mm. Pope Francis, at the end of the day, will have the final say. It's a really good reminder. Can you speak to just the enormity of this general assembly? I mean, the fact that they're putting together this synthesis document coming out Saturday, which is supposed to synthesize all the different talks they've heard throughout this month. That's right. I mean, it's 365 voting members sitting at 35 different tables, going through 100 different, uh, 120 different questions in the Instrumentum Laboris. Mm -hmm. So a lot of conversations to sort through. I think one concern uh, that people have raised is some of the members have been sorted into different themes, right? So they're the ones focusing on, on different questions at their small group tables, mm -hmm. while other people can only chime in during those general congregations. So a big question uh, that we're waiting to see the answer on mm -hmm. is whether that final synthesis document kind of accurately reflects the views of the entire assembly. And, and there were some people who were concerned because they tried to chime in but couldn't actually be heard or yeah. a cue that never mm -hmm. got to them. Exactly. I've heard from a number of people that there simply wasn't enough time uh, for them to be heard from on, on those interventions. Now, you could, even if you didn't speak, you could submit your intervention, like a written version of it, to the people organizing the synod. But again, how much weight is that going to have, especially compared to the, those reports that have come from the tables? Mm -hmm. The last week was dedicated to authority and co-responsibility responsibility in the life of the church. Obviously, it, it began raising questions about church structures. Uh, what was discussed? Mm. Yeah, well, I think uh, you're right. It was kind of the last uh, module that, that they focused on. Uh, the two ones before had much more hot button issues that the media was interested, in, such as the church's pastoral outreach to same-sex attracted people, uh, the role of women in the church. Uh, but I really think this issue that you're bringing up, Matthew, is really critical. Um, because I, I think there's really a, a discussion of how decisions are going to be made in the church going forward, including doctrinal decisions. It's kind of sort of snuck in there in a, in a very uh, kind of small way. Um, but then the talk is, well, how can we change structures of the church uh, to possibly reflect this new style of uh, decision making on doctrine? Mm -hmm. So one thing uh, to point out is Father Ormond Rush, who's right. an Australian theologian, he was picked, uh, he's an advisor here, a theological advisor mm -hmm. to the Synod Assembly. He was picked to give kind of the keynote speech introducing this final week where they're working on uh, the synthesis document. And Father Ormond Rush has really been at the forefront of this uh, vision of inverting the pyramid of the church's authority and decision making. Um, so possibly putting uh, a kind of uh, debatable idea of the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful right. at the heart of the church's decision making. Mm -hmm. The question then is, does this kind of reduce the role of the bishops who we know have the, the charism to teach us, right? Does this kind of just make them facilitators? So their job is just to listen to the people of God gathered in some mm -hmm. kind of permanent assembly voting on doctrine, and then the bishop's job is to just rubber stamp that. So a very And there was question. another theologian last week, I think, who really caught our eye too, wasn't there? Yes, Father uh, Dario Vitale, who's a, a professor here of uh, dogmatic theology at the Gregorian University, another key theological advisor to the synthesis. And he gave another keynote speech to all the members before they started talking about structures. He said we need to reimagine the entire church, including its structures in a synodal key, um, not just theologically, but also institutionally. So how can we, again, uh, go forward with this new way of decision making? So I really think that it's an issue that's maybe gone beneath the radar, but it, it's not just an issue of trying to change this doctrine here, trying to, trying to change that doctrine over there, but really a push 
to change the way that the church discerns and decides doctrine. So the, the, the technical word ecclesiology is something we're going to have yes, to focus yes, on. Yes, the while, nature and yeah. structure of the church. Yeah. We can't lose sight of this. It seems like this is really huge, you know, when it comes to our reporting. Well, speaking of reporting, yesterday during the press conference, Cardinal Prevost acknowledged the challenges the media have had in covering this specific synod. From your perspective, as a member of the media who's been here in Rome, can you speak to that? What's your experience been like? Yeah, absolutely. Pope Francis made the decision to put uh, some restrictions on what members inside Paul VI Hall could share uh, with the public, right? And mm -hmm. I think it has made it difficult because as a member of the media, you're mostly relying upon these press briefings, right? Where you're, you're kind of having an official spokesman telling you, giving you one version of going on, and then you have people kind of hand-selected to also talk about their experience as well. And I think it's difficult, and I don't want to say difficult like in a sort of selfish way, like, oh, I can't get the big headlines I want or something mm -hmm. like that. But I think what we might see here in the next few days is we might see, because things have been kept under wraps, we might see a bunch of leaks, right? We might, might see a bunch of people trying to tell the media, well, this is what really happened, especially if mm -hmm. their issues they're pushing for aren't reflected in this final synthesis document. So it's going to be very difficult if something like that emerges. Uh, to really have clarity about what really happened inside. And of course, this is meant to be a consultation of the people of God, uh, so transparency uh, is important. Yeah, talking about uh, issues and controversies, mm -hmm. uh, we had some news yesterday about Father Marco Rupnik. Uh, what's the update on, on this case? And, and first, for those who may not be familiar with him, who is he? Well, Father Marco Rupnik, you might not be familiar with the name, but you've likely seen his handiwork. He's a, a kind of famed church artist, uh, so mosaics uh, across the world, a lot in the U.S. as well. Um, but he has uh, really fallen uh, in, in complete disgrace uh, after it's come up that there have been highly credible accusations against him of serial sexu sexual abuse of religious sisters uh, who are kind of under his care. Um, and the big concern, right, is that not enough has been done to hold him to account. Not, has, not enough has been done to hold him responsible. We found out uh, just yesterday, it was made public, that he was actually received into a diocese in Slovenia, his home country, his home diocese actually, a priest in good standing to exercise his ministry in full, uh, while meanwhile uh, the victims, the people he, who he abused, uh, have, have not received their justice and he hasn't been held to account. And I think how is this affecting the Synod might be a good question. I did hear actually that members inside the Synod Hall knew as early as Monday that mm -hmm. this had happened, right? Uh, and I think maybe th the letter that they wrote to the people of God, where they mm -hmm. emphasized the importance of listening to victims of, of abuse, that, that very well yeah. might have been factored into it. But for those of us outside the Synod Hall, mm -hmm. just looking at reactions to the news from yesterday, I think it's really, um, it's really called into question, I think, to some extent, the credibility of what we're doing here in the Synod. Because the Synod, of course, is about emphasizing, listening to the whole church, especially those who have been hurt in some way or on the margins, victims of sexual abuse, of course, at the top of that list. Um, but if we're carrying out this synodal exercise while simultaneously this uh, influential priest with friends in high places is apparently allowed uh, to carry on his ministry, it, it really does uh, raise some big questions. Absolutely, yeah. and I know we'll continue to cover the latest on that throughout EWTN News. Jonathan Liedl, thank you so much for your reporting and for being here with us today. Pleasure to be with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop Robert Barron of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, and founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries, is here in Rome as a U.S. Bishop Delegate to the Synod. EWTN Vatican correspondent Colin Flynn sat down with Bishop Barron to hear his perspective on this General Assembly. Bishop Barron, great to see you again, and thank you so much for doing this interview. My pleasure. The last time we met was in beautiful Lisbon yeah. for World Youth Day. Now here we are in Rome, the Synod on Synodality. You, this isn't your first synod. How many have you been at? Not my first rodeo. I did the um, synod on young people, which was five years ago, 2018. Uh, so it's my second synod. How does this compare? We well, you know, practically they're very different. Uh, 2018, like most synods, we were in that synod hall, which I don't know if you've seen. It's over in the Paul the Sixth, but it's a somewhat claustrophobic room. <laughs> sort of theater seating. Uh, we were in cassocks the whole time, so every day in a heavy black cassock. And you're in a seat that's like the middle seat on an airplane and you're there uh, the whole time. So this one's a lot more comfortable, I'll say that. We're in, the, we're in the front area of the Paul VI, the big audience hall. They cleared out the chairs and put in these 36 round tables. 
we're also not wearing cassocks every day, just wearing the you know the black suit. So it's a little, it's more uh, comfortable, more humane, you know, easier to get through the day. And we know that there's so many different uh, perceptions of the synod and people online saying different things. But the incredible thing, when you look across the room, the universality of the church that is there. How do you find that meeting people from every corner of the globe? It's the best part of it, I think. Uh, it started for us at the retreat. You know, this uh, synod, really the synod began with the retreat out in Sacrofano, which is about a half hour north of Rome. But I remember walking into the dining room. <laughs> There'd be this cacophony sound, you know. And every table, so there's Spanish speakers here, Italian speakers there, German speakers there, French speakers there, English speakers, a mix. And, and it was the universality of the church in all of its kind of cacophonous wonder. There's no other group or society in the world, I don't think, that could muster that kind of international uh, universality. And that is an extraordinary thing. When we look around the world today, the Western world, the Catholic Church, the steep decline, something yeah. else that uh, Archbishop Fisher had mentioned, the rise of the nuns, yeah. not the N-U-N-S, but the right. N-O-N-E-S, the census form religion, nun. Right. How does it make you feel? As someone who is so passionate and committed to the church and the faith, when you see the fall, out, fall off? Yeah, I'm sick about it. And that's why I've been talking about writing about it for a long time. And see, I see it not just as an intellectual issue. It's that. There's an intellectual dimension. But what I see is the spiritual suffering of people when they say, they follow the crazy new atheist and they say, you know, I came from nothing. I'll go back to nothing. There's no uh, objective moral value. My life has no meaning. Read Richard Dawkins. I mean, he lays it out that bluntly. And people go, oh, yeah, you know, give it to religion. But then <laughs> spend time with that philosophy of life. What do you end up with? You end up with this desperately hopeless nihilism. And so I've seen reams of people, you know, who've gone down that path to deep unhappiness, deep alienation. And so I've said to my, my brothers even here, like, this is why the church is doing what it's doing. You know, we're not doing this for our health. We're doing it because we've got a life-saving message, the gospel. It's, it's not just a nice set of ideas. It's a life-saving message. And so that's why the rise of the nuns, uh, now, now, to be fair, I think they're falling again. What, and I mean that in a good way. I think people have begun to realize how desperately awful <laughs> that nihilistic view of the world is. And there's a reawakening. I think we see it in a number of ways. Reawakening of interest in, in religion. Um, so that's how I feel about that. I, I feel very passionately about it. And it's the central uh, at least in the West, it should be the central pastoral focus of the church. And I've seen you say before that the atheists, from your point of view, you said they stop asking questions just when it just gets interesting. Just when they get interesting, yes. You know, yeah, that's why I, I never buy this nonsense about, you know, religious people are, you know, being pretty scientific and not very bright. On the contrary, it seems to me, that, that the, the materialists are great at asking questions that the scientific method can handle. And that's terrific. But there's a lot of life most of what's really interesting about life that the scientific method can't handle. And it's very convenient to say, oh, I just won't ask about that. I'm just not interested. In Philosophy begins in wonder. Yeah, of course, yeah. And it begins in this, this deep hunger of, of the heart and the soul for meaning and for purpose and for truth and for beauty and for goodness. And the sciences cannot adjudicate any of that. And so I say to young people all the time, don't believe this, this sort of weird mysticism that says, uh, knowledge is reducible to science. Um, your heart tells you otherwise, and your head, if you give it a little exercise, will also tell you otherwise. So how does the church try and turn the tide again? How does it go back and evangelize to a hugely secular society now with, today? With truth and beauty. And we've got both uh, in spades in Catholicism. So we're a smart religion, and we should not dumb it down, which we have done for way too long. We call upon the intellectual richness of our, our great tradition and get boldly into that public conversation. Um, you know, I, someone I admire very much on the Protestant side, William Lane Craig, you know, who at the height of the new atheist thing, got into the debates and he, he was drawing on, frankly, much of the Catholic intellectual tradition. We Catholics were pretty bad at it. So draw on all the richness that we have intellectually and then also draw on the beauty of our tradition, which beguiles people often in a more winsome way. If they're not, Maybe they're resistant to truth claims. They're resistant to moral claims. 
but the beautiful can get into their soul in a way. So begin with truth and beauty and then have confidence. Uh, much of my adult life, and I say this with regret, the church has been in a kind of hand-wringing you know, mode of, well, what do we know and who are we to tell you and we're here to really learn more from you. Come on. Uh, Peter and Paul came to this town a long time ago and they weren't here you know, just to listen to Roman culture. I mean, fine. They were here with a message. They were here with a message. Evangelion is good news. And it's good news that will change the world. And in fact, it, it worked. The fact that over there, where Peter lies buried to this day, but dominating this once imperial capital is the cross of Jesus. You know, that didn't come welling up from Roman culture. That came from a message that these people brought. We should do our work with the same energy and the same panache and the same confidence. It's difficult, isn't it, for many priests and bishops around the world, especially when the, you see the, the days of good intellectual debate on television, yeah. on radio, in public square seem to have gone. Yeah. And now you risk suddenly hurting someone's feelings. You risk being canceled. You risk having the media against you. Is it more difficult now to preach the, the Catholic Church's beliefs and truths and ideals? Yes, in the measure that uh, our capacity for real argument, as you suggest, has... Um, has diminished. When I was a kid, there was a guy, um, William F. Buckley Jr. in America, who had this show called Firing Line. And it was one hour long. And Buckley was this, um, you know, very uh, uh, kind of interesting, quirky personality, super bright, super articulate. And he had on very smart people from all across the spectrum. He had left, center, right. He had people yeah. he agreed with, people he disagreed with. And for one hour, at a very high level of conversation, two people with like a, you know, just a neutral background, talked about serious matters. That show was on for 35 years. I remember watching as a little kid mm. and just being beguiled by this guy's words. Like, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> but the fact that our culture was able to handle that show. Yeah. Or go back even further in my country. Go back to the mid-19th century. And uh, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas would gather Illinois farmers out in the field, maybe standing in the mud, and Douglas and, and Lincoln would engage in four hours of... <laughs> high-level public conversation. Um, in our tech culture now, in the social media culture, something has been lost along those lines. Our capacity to make and sustain a real argument, and not a soundbite, not a little put-down, not a clever quip, but an argument, you know? Yes. We've, we've not lost entirely, but I think we've got a couple generations now that don't even know what a good argument is. Finally, what gives you hope? Because you mentioned we have truth, we have beauty, but the church has always had that, and yet we still see such decline. And I remember once I had a friend in New York who was going through a hard time, and I said, pray about it. And she said, how do you pray? Yeah, like the, even the base level, the foundation I, is not there. When you look at the church today, what gives you hope? A lot of things. And I, we talked about the negative side of the social media, and that's true. But, you know, look, I use the social media. I love the social media. And, you know, talk about Lisbon when I was there a few months ago. And I'm wandering around Lisbon, the number of people from all over the world that are responding to the work we do at Word on Fire, being here in Rome at the Synod, I mean, every day, people from all corners of the world. Well, that means there's something in Catholicism that is still very compelling to people. And that when it's laid out in a way that's intellectually satisfying and aesthetically pleasing and morally compelling, they respond to it. Uh, and that gives me a lot of hope, you know? And I, I don't believe this new atheist nonsense. And I, I don't believe that's going to, in the long run, hold people's hearts and minds. And the church, look, I look out at the city of Rome here, you know, and we've been around for a long time. And we've been through a lot worse than we're going through right now. So we will endure. So Christ gives me hope. And the Holy Spirit gives me hope. The, the fact that we've been given this great message. We've been entrusted with it. But we're under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we've been through a lot worse. And... The, there's still nothing better on the table. There's, there's no fresher fish on the market than Christianity. It's still <laughs> the most beautiful, compelling message that we got. Bishop Byron, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Bishop Barron had been to the Synod on Youth before. Interesting to hear his comparison between that one and the Synod on Synodality. Yes, uh, different. The whole different procedure. We've talked about it, um, but some commonalities: the the experience of universality, and uh, and the message of hope there at the end, of which Bishop Barron is a kind of a specialist in hope, and 
his hope is backed up with results. Now, you can have hope in a very bleak situation, but when we look at the success of Word on Fire, mm -hmm. which is very much, as we've said before, it's a consultative, it's a lay-led initiative, even though Bishop Barron is the face of it. Right. So it's always good to hear from him, and I'm sure that there are a lot of people in the Senate who've watched his videos from different parts of the world who are excited to see that, that he was here. And we go back to Bishop Barron's uh, groundbreaking series, Catholicism, where mm. he travels the world mm -hmm. uh, and you see the universality and the beauty of global Catholicism. Mm. He used a great phrase uh, in that interview, cacophonous mm -hmm. wonder mm. of the whole church being represented in some fashion here. And it's the lived experience uh, of also listening to the lived experience. Uh, in the, the letter from to the people of God from the Synod, they stress repeatedly the, the key of listening, yeah. uh, listening to the victims, listening to those who are also victims of racism, listening mm -hmm. to those who've suffered from war, but then also listening to those experiences of lay people and others. And I think Bishop Barron has made that a key as well of hearing those perspectives of the global church. Absolutely. I, one thing about the word cacophony, which Matthew you picked mm -hmm. up on, uh, one of the things that struck me is that when uh, Cardinal Ratzinger spoke about the Catechism from 1992, he talked about the symphony of faith. Yeah. And there's a beauty in the mm -hmm. symphony of faith. Bishop Barron is saying there's a beauty, there's a wonder. He didn't say beauty. He said wonder. There's something also with the cacophony. And when we love the symphony, we can be disturbed by the cacophony. But Bishop Barron is saying there's something about the cacophony mm -hmm. there that's the reality of the world and the faith lived out in the world. And then from that comes the symphony, which is the message, he used the word message, but that's a symphony. So that opens our minds to the possibility that there's something in the cacophony that we can treasure. Absolutely. In this letter and in Bishop Barron's comments, mm -hmm. we see this. there's a certain sober quality to this undertaking as well. Mm. You know, the, the letter speaks about everyone needing to participate in the missionary dynamism of communion. And we have seen over the last few days, and some of our guests, I think, of Bishop Kevin Rhodes yesterday, stressing that the missionary quality of this, that it is a missionary evangelization. It is a missionary synodality, mm -hmm. as he talks about it. And that means going forward. Uh, but being faithful, then, to what we're bringing out of here mm -hmm. and what we're proclaiming. And to be a missionary in 2023, you have to acknowledge the reality of Again, that term nuns, N-O-N-E-S, yes. how many people have fallen away from the faith, don't have a faith at all, or make science their faith. Um, but here again, you know, really grateful to hear well, his insights Well, that was the, uh, the official theme of the Synod is mm -hmm. communion participation and mission. And it, it has been, mission has been a bit de-emphasized. It's been a bit sort of inward focused. We've but heard a lot uh, about communion and participation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but it, it's in the title, so I'm glad that Bishop Barron directs our attention, attention to it. Absolutely. You know, I want to kind of reference the news item that we said earlier about how Pope Francis, once again, in this book no. that you have, Father Raymond, uh, has closed the door to women's ordination, and yet we're still hearing about it. Uh, why is that? Is that all part of the strategy here? Well, I, I think part of it is uh, whether there's a strategy on Pope Francis's part or not, we can talk about, but there certainly is an intentionality on the part of many in the media to talk about it. I, I hate to use that phrase again, hot button issues. Uh, Jonathan mentioned it. So it has been raised. It was raised as late as yesterday uh, in the, the press briefing, uh, again, because you have certain elements in the press who are taken up with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought Cardinal Prevost's response to the question of women's ordination uh, made things very clear, and I think Pope Francis has made it right. clear repeatedly in this mm -hmm. pontificate. Well, this is the difficulty of uh, taking your lead from the press briefings. Uh, the press briefings here are distorted yeah. because people come out, they speak in general terms about their experience, and then the, the substance of the press conference is driven by the questions, and the questions have no relation, nor should they, I mean, people ask what they want to ask, uh, to what was on, what was going on inside. So mm -hmm. the question yesterday came from an American Catholic reporter. It had nothing to do with mm -hmm. what was going on in the mm -hmm. Senate Hall. Mm -hmm. He's asked that question five years ago. He'll ask that question five years from now. So it's really quite distorting. And I think one of the lessons, Jonathan talked about the difficulty of looking, covering the Senate, is actually not to pay attention to the press briefings, because the press briefings are not driven by the actual members of the Senate. In anticipation of the, mm -hmm. the summary document that's right. expected to be coming out on Saturday, there are clues, though, 
Uh, and this is one area where I think the press briefings can be useful or to the degree that the participants are willing to talk to us. Uh, I think, for example, I think it's Cardinal Aguiaretes of uh, Mexico City who stressed, well, the discussion of women's ordinations was not a primary topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. We've had similar clues given to us by other prelates. I think of the Archbishop of Belgrade, for example, who, who mentioned, no, this is something that was really talked in side groups, but not much discussion in the actual body of deliberations itself. So again, there is that but distortion. But that's the distorting effect. Is exactly. That, is that we have three prelates talking about something that they're saying is not a main topic. We're not getting to the main topic because that's not what's driven in the press hall. And maybe discussions aren't reflective of decisions. Correct. One of the things in this book, so it wasn't on the question of women's ordination, but uh, Pope Francis asked, uh, is asked about the question of married priests, which was a big issue with the Amazon Synod. And he says here, I rejected the proposal because it came out of the Synod, mm -hmm. but I didn't close the debate. And that's very important to understand, especially in the context of this Synod. Yes. The Holy Father thinks that having people l genuinely listen to and have the chance to speak is a good thing in and of itself. He has actually been very clear about what he wants to do, and he's, he's not afraid to do it. He says, I'll decide. I've rejected this proposal. If people want to talk about it, they can talk about it. So mm. for him, the process is the purpose, as I said mm. the other day. So when uh, people get frustrated and they say, well, they're talking about that, which means they're going to do something about it, the answer is actually no. And then other people said they're talking about it, they're going to do something about it, I'm excited about it, also no. And that's a way of proceeding that is, frankly, a bit new, especially for in an American context, mm -hmm. which is you talk about something because you're, you have a proposal that you want to advance. So, right. But in, this, in that section of this book, he says, look, I rejected their proposal, but if they... I didn't close the debate. And when we understand that, I think a little bit of the anxiety about what's going on diminishes. Mm -hmm. Well, but then you add in the, the layer of social media, of the echo chamber of social media, yes. and you have certain groups, small groups, albeit, but still very loud ones. In, in, in America, it isn't necessarily whether you're going to win the argument, it's how loud you are. Right, right or how much attention uh, you can get. How much get. attention how you can, can get. Amplify but it. it's also uh, from, Pope Francis, I think, it's a pastoral approach. We have heard this from the very night of his election when he stood on the loggia right behind us in St. Peter's Basilica. This pastoral emphasis of listening, uh, and that, of course, goes to the many ways that one of the keys to understanding the synodal way, the synodal process, I should say, for, for Pope Francis. Synodality for him is listening, it's accompaniment, it's letting everyone be heard. And I, I think one thing that is very clear we're hearing this from everyone that we talk to. Mm -hmm. Everyone's being heard at some point in this synod. Well, speaking of that, does that provide more context and explanation as to why we've had those previous commissions studying the female diaconate? Well, that, he makes reference to that. He said, look, we, the people wanted to talk about this. I had a commission in 2016. They, they didn't resolve the issue. They want another commission. We had another commission. And you know, if they asked for a third one, <laughs> he would probably agree to it. Back in 2016, when he had the first commission to study the question of women deacons, he made a very public joke. He said, we have commissions, you know, we want to just get rid of something for a few years. I mean, he wasn't shy about saying that. Uh, the church often, when there's an issue that seems to be creating some tension, mm -hmm. instead of giving an answer, we'll have a study. They don't change the existing answer, but have a study that then produces more information, chance for reflection. Earlier this month, there was a study of the documents of Pope Pius XII regarding the war. That's been studied now for almost 20 years to resolve a difficult historical question. Probably most famously in the recent life of the Church, around the time of the Second Vatican Council, Pope St. John XXIII and St. Paul VI had a commission to look at the whole question of contraception. Mm -hmm. That was a very notorious time. The commission did not determine what the teaching would eventually be. So this idea of study um, is not should not be assumed that, oh, we're going to study it to see how we can proceed. Sometimes the study is actually to say, 
we're not going to proceed. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, it'll give a bit of a softer landing to those people who are disappointed. Right, and, and to provide a deeper understanding of the question, whether or not there's an answer to it. Yeah. Two things stood out to me. The process is the purpose, and to discuss is not to decide. So I think that's really important to bring to the surface. Before we uh, wrap up our program, I just want to preview looking ahead to tomorrow. Tomorrow, October 27th, Pope Francis has called for another day of prayer and fasting for an end to the war in Israel. There will be a, a special prayer vigil as well, which we'll be covering. But again, another sober reminder of what's happening in the backdrop to this synod. Yeah, the, in the letter to the people of God, uh, some, some beautiful phrases in there about that we hear the cry of the world mm -hmm. in distress. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have Ukraine, we have the Holy Land now, uh, we have Christians being persecuted everywhere. So I think those cries have been heard in the Synod Hall, and I think Pope Francis hears them very pointedly. It'll be interesting because the, the question of the war uh, in Israel and Gaza mm -hmm. and the attack by Hamas has been a delicate diplomatic issue. Uh, here, what does the Holy See say? What do the right. patriarchs in the Holy Land say? So this day for peace, peace, prayer and fasting for peace is mm -hmm. not only not controversial, <laughs> it's, it's what the church <laughs> exists for, Absolutely. but it'll be interesting to look at the background there on the diplomatic mm -hmm. side. And again, we'll have more on that tomorrow, but that concludes tonight's coverage. Thank you again, Father Raymond and Matthew. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. Again, that concludes today's special program. EWTN News presents the Synod on Synodality. We'll be right back here tomorrow, same time, same place, to bring you the top Synod News. Also, be sure to look out for our special coverage tomorrow of the Vatican's prayer vigil for peace in Israel. In the meantime, you can go to EWTNnews.com to find the latest news in the church and EWTNnews.com forward slash synod for the latest synod news. We will see you tomorrow. God bless.